Okay. Well, everyone, um, welcome to this webinar um, brought to you by Renew Economy and PSC. Um, my name is Giles Parkinson. I'm the editor of Renew Economy, and uh, thanks very much for joining us. Now, as you will have seen, the title of this uh, webinar is The Energy Transition. Will history repeat itself? I think basically the themes uh, uh, what lessons can we draw from past energy transitions? Um, what do we need to do? And what can possibly go wrong? Um, I think the good news is, is that pretty much now with a new government, with a new report from the Australian Energy Market Operator, with the new Gen Cost report from the CSIRO, uh, with lots of other studies, and just, I think most people now accept that um, we, do, we are having an energy transition and it will happen. It's just a matter of um, how, when, and how much. Of course, uh, being um, the 14th of July, there are some people in the industry who still think that the green energy transition is a bit like storming the Bastille, um, and no doubt they'll be putting up some sort of resistance. But I think that um, the way we can move forward is, is really the subject um, of this webinar. And look, we've got a great lineup. We've got a very full panel. Um, Sean McGoldrick um, uh, from uh, TAS Networks and formerly from Western Power and before that um, from Air Grid in Ireland. Um, Simon Wilkie, he's the Head of Business and Economics at Monash Business School. Uh, Monica Richter, she's the uh, Senior Manager of Low Carbon Futures at WWF Australia, but also very importantly, she's the Head Project Director of the Materials and Embodied Carbon Leaders Alliance, uh, which is very important because not just the grid that we need to transform to zero emissions, it's a lot of the industry, and she's also Project Director at the Business Renewable Centre in Australia. Uh, we also have Eric Westergaard, he's one of the Principal Consultant at PSC Consulting. We have Amir Mertash, and I'm Tried to get the R right in that, um, Amir, um, um, from the uh, systems engineer with uh, PSC, um, and also Eric Westergaard um, um, from PSC. And, um, oh, and of course, starting off will be Matt Robertson. Uh, Matt is the head of strategic service development at PSC Consulting. He's going to introduce for about five minutes, just sort of setting the theme with a few interesting graphs. We're then going to move into a panel discussion. What I'd like to do is to invite everyone um, in the audience to um, file a question. If you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A rather than the chat. You're free to chat amongst yourselves, of course. But if you put it in the Q&A, then we can find it and then we can turn to sort of audience questions. And I think that's a really important part of the webinar. We're also going to have a couple of polls. Um, so please, um, multiple choice answers. So please feel free to respond to them. We'll probably put the first one up at about um, 20 past 11 and the next one up at about uh, 20 to 12. So um, please enjoy the webinar. Without further ado, I'm going okay. to pass over to Matt Robinson from PSC. Thank you very much, Matt. Thanks, Giles. Um, right, I'll just bring up this um, the, the deck that I wanted to, to share with everybody for the next couple of minutes. Um, so the, the title obviously of today's discussion is the energy transition and will history repeat itself um, we're you know it sounds a bit like a an ill-informed um title uh, in, in, a, in a way um what does that mean surely this is a transition that's a once once in a lifetime it's never happened before it's unprecedented so how could history actually repeat itself well, if you think about it, you know, humanity's transitioned our energy supplies um, a number of times in the past. You know, we've gone from uh, horse and cart to the to cars. We've gone from burning wood to coal and using water to steam. So we've done this a, a number of times. And obviously, the one that's most prevalent in our minds of this type of thing that's happened in the past was um, early 20th century when we introduced electricity and transitioned much of our energy supply to that. So when we look back at that transition and bringing in the electricity system into being, it almost seems like it was a really planned um, approach. It was very well ordered and the governments just readily accepted the fact that this was a great idea and put in place public institutions um, and planned and planned for the whole thing. And we had policy and, the whole, and it, it all developed quite, quite nicely. Um, and so why is it that we're feeling today like this is really ad hoc and disjointed and there's not a lot of planning in place and it's really difficult and is that how it went before and why in that case should, what did we do it better a hundred years ago than the way that we're doing it now 
So I took a little bit of a look at this and came across a paper that was written in the, about 1996 for a C-grade event by a bunch of engineers in Australia. And they looked at the Australian system back then and did the same thing and looked at how this had all evolved over time. And what actually seems to have been is that what we're seeing now is almost exactly the same kind of thing that happened then. Um, it was disjointed back then. There was a lot of angst, there was um, disinterest, and it was not as well planned as we might be led to believe. So just take a look at some of these events that happened just to illustrate that, and you'll start to see some parallels, I'm sure, between what we're seeing today and what happened um, over 100 years ago. So 1880s when electricity was first demonstrated. Now there was a few um, entrepreneurs and interested individuals who lit station platforms and some buildings and showed it was a it was a great idea but it still took us another nearly 20 years for the first public supply to occur for the towns of Tamworth and Young and by this time there was you know quite a lot of interest around that people were trying to get this um, new technology embedded and, and put up and there was, it was seen as a public good but bizarrely and not uh, not dissimilar to today a lot of governments seemed largely uninterested um, there wasn't a central or federal government in Australia at the time because we hadn't federated at that point but it wasn't far off and that was a big distraction for the colonies and uh, soon to be states at the time so once federation formed the, set, the, set, the federal government still was disinterested there wasn't anything for them to do because it wasn't actually part of their job it wasn't part of the constitution it was silent and so they left it to the states to do that so we need to ro work roll on another 15 years yet before Tasmania comes to the fore and it decides to take things into its own hands and develop um, a state commission for electricity and then five years later Victoria does the same thing um, these two states, when they did that, actually set themselves apart from the other states who tended to use um, municipal authorities, individual municipal authorities to develop their own little mini micro systems, almost we call them today. And it was an interesting parallel there with what we're seeing now. As those states did that, they were able to plan their um, electricity system rollout and take advantage of the natural resources in each of those states. So at the time, Victoria. Um, developed its brown coal in Tasmania, its hydroelectricity, its hydro um, resources, and they developed themselves that way. And by taking that statewide plan view, they also were able to electrify um, the country and rural areas as part of the rollout, not just towns and cities and municipal areas. So there was a there was an advantage, a distinct advantage to them to them doing that. Um, then they attracted other industries to the along the line as well metallurgical process and transportation which uh, which occurred so there's only a few events there but we can see there's actually quite a bit of a parallel occurring between what happened then and what happened now and it took victoria if we, if we assume if we say that the system was largely built by the late 80s early 90s you can see from that in victoria it took 60 to 70 years for them to get to the point where they had a, um, a almost a finalized system we don't have that amount of time this time around we've barely got 30 years by uh, by most um most me most measures and so that's the question for today really does history have to repeat itself this way is that the way of things or can we do better and what can we learn so that we don't take 60 years to reshape our system and make sure that we don't leave those parts of society behind and so i think first off today we'll we'll throw it to sean um, I'll start with you, Sean. You lead TAS Networks and the network business in Tasmania. And as we've just seen, that puts history on your side because you were the first state electricity commission. And so whilst you might not have actually been there at the time, um, you, you might be able to help us dive into the question of how we might go about building this type of system out and implement these planning documents such as the ISP. So and um, thank you, Matt. Thanks for fascinating uh, presentation there. Um, yeah, it, it's a little um, uh, surprise to me, even as a newly minted Tasmanian, that um, Tasmania led the way there because it had such a wonderful resource and a good sea. There were some very foresightful uh, individuals who wanted to maximize the use of that uh, resource, and, and hydro industrialization was a huge um, 
benefit to the uh, to to Tasmania. But looking at it um, um, at a bit more holistically from where we are right now, first of all, I think we should set, acknowledge and celebrate the fact that we indeed do have an integrated system plan. That's an, a, a, that's a huge boon and benefit. Um, that's a very good document. It's a very detailed document, very considered document. It has established itself in a relatively short period of time as the, as the Bible really of what we need to do. And it has taken on the responsibility for uh, assisting our, our entire power system to transition and what we need to do to accomplish that. So I think that's a massive uh, thing to have, uh, a, a great thing. Um, I think, uh, first of all, it's all about doing this quickly, doing it efficiently, doing it fairly. Um, the first thing I'd say is, with respect to quickly, we have to recognize that we are in a revolution on Bastille Day. We are in a revolution and not an evolution. This is something that is inherently going to be a little bit messy, a little bit inefficient, but it's driving us societally in the right direction. Um, but we, we must recognize, and particularly all of the uh, systems and processes and structures and organizations that we have put together as an industry over the last 20 years, including the NEM that we've put together over the last 20 years, they are set up for evolution. They're not set up for a revolution. They don't do revolutions well. And, and so we have to recognize that, have that you know, a moment where we, uh, long dark night of the soul, where we realize we have to do things a little bit differently for a period of time to get through this transition. So I think that's a, we have to consider that. And it's certainly there's a number of bodies, largely those bodies beginning with A, that need to have a look at their processes and systems. And, you know, some of them are, they are indeed looking at that. So we have to encourage that. In terms of doing the uh, transition efficiently, well, I'd say that generally speaking, um, surrounded as we are in this industry by wonderful engineers and project managers, uh, we, we tend to do efficiency pretty good. But the bit that um, I think we're having trouble with at the moment is all of these projects, a significant array of projects, have to go through a development phase, they have to go through a manufacture, you know, procure, manufacture, construct phase, they have to go through a commissioning phase. I worry little about that manufacture, construct, commission phase. I think that uh, the procurement phase as well. I think we will handle that well as, a, as, as an industry, it certainly has some challenges in supply chain and so on. But the bit that is messy and difficult and we're not doing well, is the development phase of these projects. There are many good projects that are lying fallow at the moment because we can't get them up through the development phase. They lack some initial seed funding, some proper studies, some consideration to do them properly. So I, I'd like us as an industry to focus in on that development phase of the projects highlighted in particular in the integrated system plan. How do we get through that quick? That's the thing. Fairness and equity is really, really important here as well. Um, we, we all understand that if we're to transition to clean energy, we have to be able to share. We have to be able to share uh, so that when the sun shines in Queensland and the wind blows in Tasmania, um, that we can share these wonderful resources. And we're going to have to build out uh, our power network to reflect that reality. And at the moment, that burden of building um, significant interconnection in particular, harnessing new sources of energy and sharing them, um, that's done almost on a bilateral basis. The working assumption is two jurisdictions will interconnect and they will share the costs and they will share the benefits. But actually it's much broader than that. We, um, we, we all know that if we do put in place certain developments, it will benefit the NEM as a whole, each jurisdiction will benefit. Yet the costs and benefits are not aligned up. And that sharing, that fundamental sharing of line, you know, lining up costs and benefits must happen. And if that doesn't happen, it's going to actually ambush this transition. So I think we've a piece of work as an industry 
we have a piece of work to do to make sure that that happens. And if there was one magic bullet I had, if that was the thing I could solve, that would that's the one. Because once we line up the costs and benefits and it's equitable, it, it, that has a habit of making sure the right things uh, uh, take place. So there are my comments, Matt. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sean. That's great. Um, I'd like to ask Monica your, your um, perspective on, on some of this, particularly around the comments that Sean's made there about fairness and, and equity and making sure that we, uh, we bring that into the mix. Have you got a, what are your views on, on how we might be able to do that and, and, and ensure that we, we, we bring some fairness and equity into this transition? Thanks, Matt. Wonderful to be here with all you, all of you. So, you know, I've worked on climate and energy issues in the NGO sector for the last, over 20 years now. And in 2004, just sort of building on the theme of this webinar, I went on a listening tour to Victorian regional communities where a lot of these wind farms were being developed, you know, Bald Hills, Ararat and so on, uh, Meridian and... What I know, because because there was a lot of pushback from communities. They were saying, well, all these, we're being overwhelmed by wind farms. We have no resources to try and manage the impact on our communities. We're not being given any sense of, you know, what's good, what's not. Um, impacts, you might recall the orange-bellied parrot uh, and the impacts uh, there. So all of these issues... Uh, meant that communities were opposed to the wind farm. Some farmers got revenue, other farmers on the other side of the road didn't get revenue. You had councils, conservative councils trying to speak to the state government, the state government, Labor government not interested. So, you know, the, the politics, the community, the high conservation value, all these issues were very, very, very poorly managed. And this was before the Clean Energy Council uh, was in place and before the Australian Wind Association, as it was at the time, had some best practice policies in place. So if we don't want history to repeat itself, and if we're looking at a revolution, not an evolution here, then we need to be putting in place what is currently considered to be best practice. And that means no developments in high conservation value areas. We have to have some no-go areas. And you know we can come back and talk about that at another time if we need to. We have to make sure that communities and First Nations uh, people are deeply engaged, that they have as part of the pre-design procurement process that they have not just consulted free prior and informed consent, but also that the infrastructure, community infrastructure funds are established to build out infrastructure for these communities, um, that there are local jobs, that Local supply chains are part of the contractual arrangements we put in place so that we have these best practice uh, projects that will give communities a sense of shared ownership uh, and that they see themselves as part of this because most of these projects are going to be developed in regional and rural communities and we need to make sure that if we're not if we're going to Mass, you know, we're not talking about 100%, we're talking about 700% renewables but potential around Australia as a renewable energy superpower, then we need to make sure that we look after people, our First Nation people, our communities, uh, but also the biodiversity elements. Otherwise, I can absolutely guarantee NGOs are already talking about it. We are going to be battling um, a lot of the uh, pushback from, uh, from communities and NGOs who really are concerned about the biodiversity, potential biodiversity impact. So we have to, we have to talk, we have to continue to talk, and we have to make sure that um, we set those best practice principles in place. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. That's wonderful. Great to get that, that perspective on things. Um, Simon, I'd like to throw to you as well, just sort of um, take, picking up on a, another angle on some of these things. Is there You've probably witnessed some of some market developments in your time, and so as, and Eric would have done as as well. Um, any commentary from yourself on how um, regulation, market design, and um, those types of things could back up both of what Sean and uh, Monica have been talking about? Uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, 
it's actually like a kid in a candy store if you're a market designer here <laughs> for the reasons that uh uh sean and uh monica talked about it's really a complicated problem right uh this transition is not just about the engineering of how we build out the grid for the future and how we um, get distributed energy systems um, to work efficiently but it's also about how we design um, the market and regulatory structures um, to get to where we want to go so it's an epic uh, it's an epic uh, uh, design problem uh, really fascinating. I, we've put together a group at Monash of researchers to work on precisely that issue. Um, we have gone through that. My background is, is more of a telecom guy who um, dabbles in, in energy markets. Uh, and we've gone through a fairly significant transition in the, in the telecom industry and um, uh, with the move to wireless and the move to um, fiber killing off a lot of existing infrastructure, uh, changing the architecture of the system. Um, uh, so that was pretty painful, um, but it can be done. But what I want to say at the very, very, I'm going to talk at a very abstract level. Um, when we want to design anything, whether it's a new market or a new regulatory framework, you know, there's several desiderata that we would like. Um, we would like the system to be fair, uh, as, as Monica and Sean pointed out, everybody needs to benefit. It's a positive benefit for us to be part of this system. Um, we would like the system to be efficient. Uh, we would not want it to be wasting resources. Um, we would like it to be balanced. So, uh, the money from one side is paid to the other side. Um, we don't need to magically create, um, funds or, or have tax dollars flowing in or, um, somebody extracting money out. And we would like it to be, if you're a market designer, strategy proof so that the transition can't be manipulated. Okay. Here's the bad news. That's impossible. <laughs> you can get three out of four. You can't get four out of four. That's a theorem by uh, Green and Lafont. Um, so I think we need to face the reality that we can't give everybody everything. And so which one do we throw under the bus? Um, I think the idea of balancedness, we need to recognize exactly, um, as was pointed out um, uh, in the introduction, that this is a national transition, right? It's going to be benefiting the whole country independent of the amount of energy that you consume. And therefore, if if there isn't an, we might have to look at this as something that's subsidized at a national basis, right? In order to recover, um, rather than trying to load it into pricing. Uh, so if we are trying to preserve um, properties that, you know, it might look efficient to put a wind farm in an area that destroys an area of natural heritage or it threatens um, uh, biodiversity. Okay, it has to be relocated. Well, that funds that benefits the whole of Australia, right? So rather than trying to load that extra cost into pricing, let's take it out of pricing because the pricing is just going to distort the decisions. Let's let's explicitly recognize what it is and and and. and cover those relocation costs from outside the system. So I think we need to be thinking a little bit like that, um, breaking it down into what should be recovered from prices and what's going to mess price signals up. And uh, through that lens, sometimes you arrive at a different outcome. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. That's great. Good, good, uh, good perspective there. Um, Amir. Amir, can I just... Sorry, yes. So, sorry, Matt, can I just add to that? Yeah, I think the important thing that people need to keep in the back of their mind all the way through this is that you know, you know coming back to our theme um, of history repeating itself is that the electricity systems as we know them today essentially arose from a social compact um, that you know was developed so that you know people were guaranteed um, an electrical supply at a, low pro, uh, at a low price. And that gave rise to that, you know, the beginning of the concepts of, you know, um, franchises, so which, you know, SECV and so on in Australia. 
um, and the regulated monopoly utilities in North America and Europe and places like that, um, and that supplier of last resort. And that model worked for an extremely long period of time as growth uh, was occurring in global economies, particularly after the Second World War when you know, we wanted to create jobs, so we built massive power projects all over the place. And that was you know, great for the economies. Um, but we're at that inflection point, I think, at the moment, where technologies are changing dramatically. And how do we maintain that social compact uh, with consumers? You know, where in so many places, one, the level of reliability that they're seeing is actually declining. And it's declining when the costs of that service is actually going up as, as well. And I think that's something that we have to pay real attention to because if we don't, um, as we've seen in so many different spheres with new technology, that technology can have a material impact on incumbents um, and it may destroy their existing business models. And so that to me is a real part of that, you know, that challenge that exists. If you go back a hundred years, you know, what is it now, 110 years when we got 110 kV uh, transmission. And I think the anniversary of you know, greater than 200 kV transmission is probably this year or next year. I can't remember the exact date, but it's you know, coming up. One of the consequences of that was a lot of um, you know, central power stations. But one of the costs of that is a lot of those um, regional schemes that were originally developed to meet the needs of local communities disappeared. And when they disappeared, we lost a lot of innovation because a lot of those small nimble operators also disappeared. But what we're seeing today is any number of new nimble innovative organizations bringing potentially game-changing technologies to the sector. And I think part of the challenge is we need to think of you know, a range of potential scenarios for the development of the industry over the next 20, 30 years. It may actually happen much faster than many of us um, imagine. You know, I got asked a question some time ago you know, about who do I talk to about you know, the changes. Um, my late father was an electrical engineer. I didn't ask him about what he thought the future would be. I asked my children because you know, they're the young generation. They're the ones that will adopt the new technologies. And I think that's, again, you know, incumbent upon leaders in this industry to, you know, to ask the right questions of the right people. Um, as somebody who's been around market developments in the electricity sector for you know, coming up for you know, 40 years, um, I know a little bit, but I've got you know, no monopoly on what I think is going to happen in the future. I think we just have to be prepared for any number of outcomes, many of which, you know, 30 years from now, we probably didn't even think, we're not even thinking about today. Good points, Eric. Thank you for that. And um, Giles, did you want to um, pick a few questions to, to throw to, to some of the panelists on, on the back of that? Unmute myself. Oh, that's the first thing I'm going to do. Um, look, a couple of very quick questions and some some reasonably quick answers, just so we can get through to them. Um, there's a lot of talk about transmission because one of the big things about the ISP, of course, is building enough infrastructures that we can connect things. So um, one of the constant questions I get to hear is about uh, overhead transmission lines and can we put them underground? Um, Sean, one of your major projects is actually putting some new ones under sea. Can you answer sort of both questions very quickly? Um, because you've also got some issues in Tasmania with um, um, sort of reserves, I'm thinking of the Tarkine and, and, and parts of that. So practicalities of going underground, is it, is it, how much more expensive is it? Is there any less environmental impact, um, et cetera? So um, thanks for the question, Giles. Um, look, it, it's a constant debate, of course. I mean, <coughs> ultimately, it's a trade-off. Um, uh, in certain circumstances, 
it is desirable to go underground and it is possible to go underground. Um, undergrounding itself is at this stage with the maturity of the technology, particularly at higher voltages, is of the order of eight to 10 times more expensive than a similar overhead line um, uh, from an alternating current point of view. So there is an investment required. So there's a gap there at higher voltages of transmission uh, if you want to go underground versus uh, overhead. Um, with respect to underground, uh, leaving aside the technicality of it, 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 it's not necessarily a panacea for, um, uh, for environmental concerns and for disturbance of land concerns. Uh, there would be many, many people that say that actually undergrounding a transmission line is much more disruptive um, in, in a landscape than ultimately than an overhead uh, solution. Um, so for example, if you underground, you're certainly going to have to keep the ground above where the cable is laid clear, uh, very clear of, of vegetation. You are going to have to have inspection pits and jointing pits um, every um, it, at rather frequent uh, 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 spots along the line. Um, so it's not that there will be no in, uh, visible infrastructure or no visible mm. uh, uh, visual impact or impact on the landscape. So it, it has its limitations as a technology as well. Um, from an, an old power system operations background myself, uh, one of the significant benefits of having an overhead structure as opposed to underground is that it's much quicker to get to and resolve issues if there is a problem or a fault. It can take quite some time uh, yeah. to do it uh, with, from a cable point of view. Overhead line is, tends to be more amenable to quicker repairs. Uh, on the other hand, underground is a little bit more resilient with respect to weather events. So it's a trade-off, Giles. Um, I think horses for courses. There are some areas that you simply cannot do underground, obviously. Uh, significant rock or tar systems, uh, areas prone to flooding. It's, it's uh, you know, there's some areas that you simply can't, even with respect to cost, countenance, even if you were willing to put in the extra cost, countenance uh, going, going on. The ground. Yeah. So very so, much horses for horses. Simon, I think we we're just discussing before the webinar started actually about wireless transmission. Um, is that a thing? How far away are we away from it? Oh, uh, no, it is a thing. Uh, uh, I think, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's already happening. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I was on a, on a different panel the other day and the message of the panel was, there's no point in waiting for a new technology, right? The technology, the technology components are already here. Um, uh, we have incredibly cheap sources of renewables um both wind and solar um we have uh the advances in battery technology uh, we have the possibilities of pumped hydro um, we have um distributed systems in countries like norway where they're using um because everybody in norway has a tesla um that can also be distributed storage as well as putting demands on the grid it also can supply back into the grid if you deploy iot the iot optimization can be done in the cloud it's already there so the a lot of the technology components are already there they're off the shelf right we don't have to sit around waiting for hydrogen um we just need to get moving um and but to get moving is difficult because of all the politics and the fact that there will be winners and losers unless we come up with some yeah. uh, equitable way of, of doing the transitioning costs. So I think uh, it really is the equity issue rather than technology issue. Um, I'm happy to have anybody disagree with me, but um, I think that's the main impediment. Monica, I'm just going to bring in Amir um, too in a minute because we haven't heard from Amir yet. Um, apologies, um, but uh, Monica, just very briefly, um, if we're going to have overhead transmission lines, um, they could be an issue. How do we manage that right from the start? Well, I think it's really important to be engaging with communities and environment groups very early. Uh, you know, as I indicated, there are going to be some biodiversity hotspots, high conservation value areas, which are no goes. So, you know, let's let's agree on what they are, and uh, then with the transmission lines, you know, making sure that we have those conversations early, 
with uh, the environment groups that are responsible for that and, you know, and, and genuinely talk about that collaboration and consultation is going to be a really important part. Otherwise, you know, you will get local communities uh, pushing back on that. Yeah. Uh, Amir, I'm not too sure this is a question for you, um, but and, and I think Matt's got one coming up for you anyway, but I just thought I'd just throw to you, do you actually need that many transmission lines? Because there's a big debate about, um, you know, battery storage and sort of, you know, like centralised or um, sort of big grid ideas, and then the sort of the distributed type level on that, you know, how much can be battery storage and, and, and spread around? Do you have any thoughts about that? Oh, that... That one, um, really, it needs to be, again, it's some sort of trade-off and quite a lot of investigation and studies need to be done. There is pros and cons in each of those items. Like, uh, But from what we are seeing in the, in the system is batteries, yes, battery energy storage systems, they are helpful in many shape, way, shapes and forms. But uh, to be able to, again, have that facility, uh, facility and being able to provide that sort of facility to the other part of network, you need to have that uh, that sort of path and that transmission system is. And that's why, for example, um, like these um, renewable energy zones and these ones can, can uh, sort of come in play as well, that uh, it's not all about having the battery. Yes, battery is good, it, but the fact that the, the fact that how do you want to use it uh, uh, and the network that we are having, um, what type of batteries are we talking about? Like there are some type of batteries that can help with the weak network uh, and with different type of, type of operations can, can be definitely helpful. If you go with the high technologies and, and so on, absolutely they're gonna be helpful. And it, it all depends how far and how wide do you want to use that facility? And like we are seeing that some, uh, it's developing quite a lot, like, like the plant just being a, a battery, a, a best, plant itself, there are quite large plants are being developed in Australia and worldwide. And, and those are one of the reasons, yeah. Um, I'm gonna hand back to you, Matt, but uh, can I just ask um, Sam if he can post the first of the um, of the polls um, um, so we can get an answer. Anyway, back to you, Matt. Thanks, Charles. I wanted to actually um, just build on some of the questioning for Amir that we had just then. I mean, um, obviously these new technologies, batteries, solar um, and wind, very different type of technologies to the, to the large thermal uh, rotating machines that we've been used to on the system. We've had a lot of discourse recently, you know, over recent years about the loss of inertia and the instability on the system. And, you know, we actually, you know, we've got to keep that inertia there. Um, what are we seeing in your, in your work around modeling networks and doing analysis on systems? What are we seeing there in the development of inverters and this new technology? Is it able to just pick up the, pick up the slack and the reins from the old technology and keep going or do we are we still still missing something uh the, these the technologies are uh, like improving and developing and uh, enhancing like every uh, day so it's just a matter of being um, and and the more problems will come up it's not necessarily these new technologies that we are seeing um, they're not always in help. They're not always helping. Sometimes they will come with their own problems as well. So it's just a matter of managing them. And with the new technologies that we are seeing, for example, with the batteries we briefly touched on, uh, having grid formings, for example, inverters rather than grid falling inverters, is going to be useful. But there are uh, and different type of like even battery energy sources system we have they can be dc coupled ac coupled and so on so some of these ones are relatively new technologies they, uh, and some of the issues with them hasn't been quite exposed yet but overall all these new technologies come with lots of new benefits for the network so, and yeah absolutely uh, but the thing is if we were to build this network from the beginning, maybe there was a, it could have been better to have some criteria with this new technology that we have in place. So we could have said, okay, yep, let's uh, use grid forming inverters from uh, this stage. But now that we have, we already have a huge amount and percentage of the network already with the older technologies, we are trying to feed in this new technology in, and then we need to make sure that that balance is there. And even some of the old technologies might be improved and uh, might be just upgraded to the new technology as well. So there's a, it's, that, that's the key word is transition, isn't it? To, yes, to, yes. to go through Absolutely. a phase where we've got both technologies operating and how, how we make sure that works. Um, Eric, you were making a point earlier about um, making sure that we, um, you know, we look, we look to the future and we're able to incorporate these technologies. Is there, is there a, um, a pearl of wisdom you can you can share with us about 
how we make sure we don't um, short sell ourselves into the future? Yeah, look, I, um, it, it's a real dilemma for the industry because you know we, we know that battery technologies, um, vehicles to grids or vehicles to homes, you know the implication of that. Um, we've seen in you know the last couple of years, um, PG and E. Um, in the United States actually now blacking out large areas of the state because of the risk from transmission lines during their fire season. You know, so what are the implications of that, in, you know, in Australia, for example, uh, with, with climate change? So do we see, you know, far greater penetration of uh, batteries? Um, where is fuel cell technology, you know, going to go? Um, you know, I don't know, there's best part of probably 45 million cars um, in Australia at, you know, 50 kilowatts each motor vehicle. That's a huge amount of potential capacity that's there to, you know, um, support a power system. Uh, will it happen? I don't know. It could very well. But what are the levers that have to be pulled by policymakers? by the industry, by others, to actually enable some of these things. And I think that's the part of the debate that we've got to have is, you know, what is um, the potential that's in front of us with some of these new technologies and how do we enable it and how quickly can we enable it as well? You know, I can envisage that in, you know, 15 years, we still don't have, you know, appropriate standards for vehicles to discharge um, to the grid, because you know incumbents and others will block it, um, and we've seen that in other industries. But one would argue that there's huge benefits from that. Um, you know, we know that we have a massive investment in infrastructure that's required because much of the old transmission and distribution and generation is getting, or is even in some instances, past the end of its economic life. So what do we do to address that without imposing unnecessary costs on consumers um, and still give them the level of reliability uh, and security that they are expecting? Fantastic, thanks. So I think that's um, talking of EVs and uh, one of the interesting things of the transition, of course, is we start to bring in and merge different markets together so transportation and industry start to merge together with the electricity to supply sector and all player it's not just a, a giver and a receiver or a cust client and customer relationship it is, is quite a different type of relationship um simon do you, are you seeing um emerging models from your research or any other part of what you're involved in that um around that merging of markets yeah, I think so. Uh, one of the possibilities is rethinking um, what the market is uh, and thinking about um, electricity as a service. So rather than, um, particularly with, with smart devices, smart hubs, IoT, um, you know, uh, if I've got my uh, EV plugged in and I have to drive to work at eight o'clock in the morning, um, you know, I don't really care whether it's being charged or discharged, as long as it's as long as it's ready to go at eight in the morning, right? Uh, so I can have an agent um, optimizing for me as to whether my car is selling into the grid or pulling power from the grid, um, uh, and then the service that's being sold to me is rather than you know uh, fifty kilowatt hours, it's that my car will be charged at eight in the morning, and you could have that being more expensive than having your car charged at nine in the morning or 10 in the morning, right? The greater the flexibility, if I think of the energy now as a service, rather than a unit being transmitted, um, it allows different types of price discrimination, uh, different types of prioritization. Um, and so uh, I, I I think we'll see, see a lot of innovation there um, to, to address some of the problems that Eric's uh, Eric's mentioned, uh, and as he mentioned, uh, the biggest problem might be incumbents who want to stop this from happening. <laughs> I'll make a couple of comments here. I mean, you might recall, what was it, 15 years ago, 
New South Wales government led the charge on feed-in tariffs. I think Victorian government was there as well. So, you know, they were really innovative policy solutions to help drive and accelerate the uptake of rooftop solar. So we probably need some kind of policy levers of that nature to help the residential uh, sector to you know, accelerate the uptake of EVs, mm. Um, drive, you know, subsidise or, or some kind of incentives or low financing options for, for batteries, for residential communities to, you know, address some of that peak load demand. And then on the industry side, you know, the industries that I've been speaking to in the work that I've been doing around decarbonising the building materials and construction materials sector, steel, aluminium and so forth, you know, they're looking for, they, they, they've all got net zero commitments, they're all looking for renewable energy projects, but they also need to have uh, security of supply and, you know, it needs to be reliable. So, you know, there's good storage options there, uh, but also affordable uh, for, for them. And we know, you know, Rio Tinto and uh, Alcoa in the Hunter Valley, you know, they've, they've made a commitment around renewable energy moving towards 100% uh, renewables by 20. 29, which I think is a very exciting opportunity for the grid because they're such an important player uh, for the national electricity market. Um, you know, Blue Scope are looking for something similar. So we, to me, there's a very significant role for governments, you know, federal government with state governments to be thinking about these creative policy solutions to help fast track uh, this acceleration uh, towards renewables. Excellent. Uh, yeah, good can, 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 Matt, can I just add yep. to that? I, I think, you know, one of the other things that needs to happen is we need to break down some of the silos within government. You know, we talk about the renewable, you know, energy um, as if it's an electricity sector issue, but mm. it's not. You know, if you think about, you know, the transportation sector, and the implications on it. Um, if you think about um, the health sector, you know, with climate change, increasing temperatures, you know, the building standards in Australia and in New Zealand are wholly inadequate, you know, and we can do a hell of a lot better and we need to, but it makes the ability to transition to this new environment so much easier if we break some silos down and get more parties talking about where all of those benefits are going to come from and get them all pulled together into the equation. Because when you pull all the uh, benefits together, they will quite quickly, I imagine, swamp the costs of some of the change that we're talking about. But if you're not including all of the benefits uh, in the equation, then it's easy to say, well, you know, the benefits aren't there yet, so we won't do it. But when you add in all of the other sectors, you know, the, you know one would argue that they are there. Yeah, and uh, to add to the, those one, those discussions that uh, Monica and the gentleman mentioned, again, to me as well, the same thing. Uh, we have to talk. Different parties have to talk. And uh, to get the, having policies and the initiatives and incentives, everything in place, yes, it's good. But do we have the infrastructure in place? To have to accommodate those. If if we say we provide lots of incentives, uh, is the infrastructure in place that okay, uh, like plannings and everything that is being done for the uh, electricity network, are are they considering what level of uptake of EV and what sort of planning has already been considered? Is it um, so like on these situations? Usually it comes down to like because when they are doing planning, they do based on some uh, load forecasting and so on. So this is something relatively new in this market. So how, do, how are we going to deal with those ones? Sometimes we, are, we, are, we have been comfortable with looking into historical data, but now we are in a position that, no, this is a new thing. How do we want to deal with it? And we, we probably need to consider, okay, if we have high, low or medium uptake of EVs, how that one is going to be reflected in your forecast? How do you, do you need to adopt your infrastructure? And, and then we can talk it from there. So it is, again, going back to that initial comments that Monica made earlier, we have to talk. So every, all the parties have to, yeah, definitely talk. Hmm. All right, thanks, thanks Amir. That's really, yeah, good insights. Insights, it's, uh, it's a different world, the way we plan and the way and, and how, we, how we might get there. We're not gonna be able to rely on the same old models that we, we used to. Giles, have we 
got some results from that that poll now there's uh, how what does the audience think we're going to do in terms of getting um hi matt um it looks like you pressed the mute button a little bit too quickly but it looks like looking at the uh, poll results here um it looks like um, 64, 75% think that we're going to get uh, to 100% renewables by 2040, 13% um, by 2030, 33% by 2035, as people can see, 10% saying never. Um, we did joke before that we might sort of kick you off the panel if I'll kick off the thing, but we're not going to do that. Um, that would be rude. Just very briefly, Matt, um, your date. I'm going to ask every panelist a quick date. What, what do they think is possible? Matt, what do you reckon? Oh, from my perspective, I, I think we could do it by 2030. Um, in, in fact, in some states, we probably need to, because if you look at Victoria, we're planning on removing all of the coal by 2032. So we're going to have to do something fairly drastic to get there. Um, but the, chat, the the probability is, in my mind, is probably more of a 2035 type date for me. Um, Sean, you have the um, the privilege of already being there in 100% um, in, in Tasmania, but um, a lot of people think about what, what about for the rest of the country, so, which would be largely based around wind and solar, and so it's a different problem. So I, I, I think 2035 is too late. Um, <clears throat> it's very interesting to hear the debate <clears throat> about technology and change and transition in our industry, but let's all remember that this comes down to continuity of supply, security of supply, and, and if we do not have a reliable and secure power system. Our entire economy suffers tremendously. We only recently saw how what uh, oscillations happened, perturbations happened when we had some issues that didn't even actually eventuate. Um, but if we're not locked and loaded, if we're not substantially on the journey by 2030, I think we're in for a period of significant volatility. And uh, that just simply from a, a broad societal point of view cannot occur. Um, the um, modern power systems are essential for the good functioning of the economy and society broadly. So I think it has to be done by 2030. Happy to report that we are 100% renewable here in, in Tasmania, and we have ambitions to be 150% by 2030, helping Victoria and the rest of the men, and by 2040, 200%. And um, so that is the ambition here. That's the political direction. And it's something uh, that we in utility land are very happy to support and direct. I'd recommend 2030 for the rest of them. Very good. Amir? Yeah, as much as I like it to be earlier, but because I'm so concerned about the security of supply and everything, so I would go with more like around 2035. No worries. Monica? Uh, being the eternal optimist that I am, uh, I'll go for a 2030 uh, time frame as well. I do think that, uh, you know, government, they are on the race to achieve this uh, with a new federal government in place, you know, with a very high level of ambition. And we seem to be, you know, in, in, the, in the time of federal cooperation and industry on the journey uh, and investors there as well. Uh, you know, it's not that we don't have significant challenges to deal with, but I'm saying eight years time, we can easily do that. Simon. Um, I'm going to go with 2035, um, but with, a, with, 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 with an academic uh, footnote, uh, <laughs> which is I'm interpreting 100% as 100% capacity rather than 100% being delivered. Uh, like in South Australia, I still think you'll need some, you know, non-renewables for the last you know, 1% or something like that, just because, uh, uh, you know, 5 to 1% just to uh, deal with emergencies like we have currently going on now. Um, yes, I, I think the email modeling makes it pretty clear that um, they can get to 95% and see the way forward in that reasonably clearly. Um, it's yeah. that last 5%, which is hard. And that last 5% could be actually hydrogen, um, green hydrogen, one hopes, um, yep. powered, but um, I guess that remains to be seen. Um, Eric, um, your view on that? Yeah, I, you know, of the view that we need to do it by 2030. Um, you know, like Simon and others, I'm not sure that we can do it and maintain security of supply, which leads me to, you know, the assumption um, that we actually need to be building significantly more than 100% of the capacity because, you know, the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine, 
um, and it doesn't always rain. So we're not going to have the hydro, the wind or the solar when we may want it. Uh, if we overbuild and then link it into other renewable uh, energy, such as green hydrogen, then we can do it. Um, being a, you know, an economist, I'll also put a footnote um, and that is, it's not a problem for any single country. This is a global issue. Um, and so the big issue is going to be global supply chains. You know, we're seeing in Europe because of the Ukrainian uh, war, uh, huge pressure on energy security in Europe. Um, if Europe decides that we are going to address that, then the production capacity there to supply Australia or anywhere else in the world that's looking for uh, renewable energy is going to be heavily curtailed. That's possibly where governments are going to have to say, OK, we are going to set up those domestic industries so we can deliver on our objectives. Well, you've very nicely provided a segue to my next round of questions and also our next poll. Um, Sam, I'm just wondering if you can put that poll up. It's a um, multiple choice answer. What are the main obstacles? Is it technology, political will, rules and regulations, supply chain constraints, social license, access to capital or incumbency? Um, I'm just wond uh, wondering, um, a lot of the questions that we have um, are about, you know, the political will and the design of the markets. Sean, I'm just wondering if you can share um, what you think is as, as the biggest obstacles and, and if you care to, or some of the other panelists when we when we'll get around, you know, um, does the change in political environment help the, one of my big questions is we've got to change the political will quite clearly. Do we, will that help solve the issue about actually designing the market in the right way? Because that seems to have been stalled over the last couple of years. So uh, quite a menu there, Giles. Uh, <laughs> everything, uh, and a good one. I mean, all of these things are issues. Um, to me, uh, it's not technology. Um, as we've already had a decent debate about technology, we, we're getting great technology appearing in our industry. Power electronics is reaching a new pitch. Um, it's a very accepting industry of new technology. And I think integrating it is something that uh, you know, our engineering cohort absolutely loves to do and enjoy. So I, for me, it's not that. It's the combination of political will and rules and regulations. Um, supply chain, I'll acknowledge, is an issue. But again, if the, if the money is there, if the projects are there, the supply chain will respond. Um, social license would be up there for me as well. Uh, I, I think we've had an excellent discussion about that. Nothing, uh, none of this major infrastructure is going to be built unless we get it right with, from respect, with respect to social license. That's both from a landowner point of view, a community point of view, and a broader societal point of view. And each of those different groups need something uh, uh, in this debate, yeah. uh, have to get something out of it. Access to capital will be fine. I have people ringing me up every day of the week wanting to finance projects. I just can't find a way to pay for them yet. Uh, so I don't think access to capital is going to be a problem. Incumbency, um, I'm, I don't detect any significant issue. Um, if there is any um, incumbents who are trying to put the brakes on the transition, I think they'll, uh, they'll go the way of all such uh, uh, entities in history. They'll just do themselves out of business. And uh, I think the politicians are pretty alive and the regulators are pretty alive to any uh, nefarious behavior in that regard. To me, it's um, if I had to pick three, it would be political will, rules and regulations and social license. Those are the things that we need to address. Monica, I'm going to take a bit of a punt here and suggest that you might agree with Sean there. But do you think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but do you think that the change in po politics um, is actually going to help address in the necessary means, the, the, the other two big issues about rules and regulations and social license? I think it will definitely help around the rules and regulations. I think there's a lot of goodwill to work collaboratively together. I'm not necessarily convinced that it will address the social license piece. I think that's going to be something that will need to be very well managed. Uh, mm. And there's quite, there's a lot more work to do uh, to find a way to make it work for everybody. And, you know, we're talking about fairness for people who uh, come from disadvantaged backgrounds where the price of electricity is very, very high, where they're living in, you know, crappy houses that uh, are three-star rather than what is mandated, you know, five, six-star. 
now all the way through to the First Nations communities where a lot of these projects are going to be built and we have you know, that social dislocation and it's you know, not just about jobs, but I, I think there's you know, really a need to be thinking about how do we address those, those issues uh, yeah, yeah. seriously. Simon, just very briefly, um, what, what, about, um, what about you? What are you? Simon? Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> hang on a sec. I was uh, I was responding to a chat, got distracted. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, all right. Uh, I think we've been in um, all in too much agreement here, so I'm going to pick a fight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, I think incumbency is more of a problem than 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 uh, might be recognised. Um, uh, I think we income. So, for example, currently there's a debate around capacity markets. Right, introducing capacity markets benefits incumbents. Uh, it has the potential to delay. I think if it's incorrectly designed, um, the deployment of storage in the grid. Uh, so uh, it's not that you behave in a nefarious way. Um, uh, we're all sitting here typing on QWERTY keyboards. The QWERTY keyboard was designed to stop keys jamming. Um, there's more efficient designs for keyboards, but then, you know, 150 late years later, we're still using the incumbent. Why? Because the Remington typewriter company subsidized cheap typewriters, but they sold through secretarial schools. So secretaries all learned to type on QWERTY keyboards and nobody could enter the market. So um, I think we shouldn't underestimate the power of incumbency. And I think we need to uh, bring that into um, politics. So I, I think it's not technology. Uh, we need rules and regulatory reform, but we need the political will um, to get there. Um, that's my take. And, and Simon, just to build on that, there's a lot of comments there around uh, the fossil fuel industry as you know part, part of the problem that we face here uh, and their incumbents in here. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, be it coal, be it gas in particular, and we're still starting to see that pushback. But you know, ho hopefully, when we see cheaper renewables being delivered uh, with secure storage, we'll, we'll find a way through that. Yeah, Amir, can you share your perspective on that one? Yeah, uh, some some aspects of maybe political will there from my point of view, but uh, also I don't know where uh, these uh, ones sit uh, in terms of uh, the capability of the network. And when I'm talking, when we are talking about uh, the energy transition, we are talking about 100% renewable, right? At this stage. So to get there, still I can say. Um, technology somehow can be important. I'm not saying the technology is there, but implementing and utilizing that technology with the existing network and make it work, that's the challenge. So that's why I'm trying to uh, sort of struggle to find an, an answer between these choices. But yeah, to me, that is the most challenging at the moment, because let's say if you have the technology, yep, the best technology is there, but you need to be able to implement that technology in the existing network and make this transition as smooth. That's the challenge. Mm. And um, Eric, um, um, did you have something to add? I'm, I'm particularly interested in, anyone's, in any any comments about electric vehicles because that seems to be the next big transition that we're sort of appointed to have and how that all kind of happens. So I'm sorry if I just will butt in there, Matt, but I'm just interested in just getting a discussion about that because there's a few questions about EVs as well. Can, can, I, can I just you know, respond to the poll? That whole question of incumbency, I think one of the other aspects is um, that's not quite incumbency, but it's similar, and that's capture, is the ability of organisations to capture the change process. Um, and that's something that we have to be very, very cautious about. And that capture could come from, you know, any number of sectors. You know, um, the oil and gas industry, for example, has, you know, been very, very good historically at capturing change in various sectors. Um, so has the incumbent you know, motor industry. You know, it's one of the reasons why we don't have as efficient public transport um, as we could have had because of capture of that change process. And I think that's something that we have to be careful about. Um, the, the question about political will though, um, that's a short-term thing surely. 
because old people who may be more conservative um, are going to die at some stage. And the young people who are more concerned about some of these things uh, are the, you know, the voters. And once that younger demographic and more of them get out and start voting, I think that political will issue will disappear as well because they won't be shy to vote to change government to get the outcomes that they're looking for. Matt, did you have any more questions or should we continue with the um, with some of the um, 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 audience questions? I'm happy for us to keep going with the audience questions. There's a lot of them coming through and there, there's obviously a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of sentiment bit pent up in the audience here. Yeah. <laughs> Does anyone want to sort of buy into EVs and the integration of the grid there too? Because it's it's an interesting um, it's uh, it's an interesting um, it's an interesting uh, aspect of uh, how consumption will be increased and, and managed, but also um, as we kind of alluded to, um, just this massive resource. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll bite a bit. Um, so I think you know. It, First of all, it points to the failure of a policy in Australia on the slow take up of EVs here, um, where our policy has been, you know, if not hostile to, to them, uh, uh, certainly incredibly slow adoption compared with um, California, for example. Um, back in California, I have a, a Fiat 500. Uh, which is a terrible petrol car, but a wonderful little electric vehicle <laughs> um, uh, for driving around town. Um, and, you know, they only sell it in California originally because they need to meet the cafe, the regulatory requirements um, for fuel efficiency for the fleet there. Um, we don't have a similar mechanism, mechanism here. Uh, so I think it presents us with a wonderful opportunity. And um, back in my previous life, when I was at Microsoft, we worked with Agda Energy in um, Norway on how you could deploy uh, an IoT system at the community level um, and, and utilize the fact that everybody in Norway has a Tesla <laughs> uh, uh, as this incredibly uh, efficient distributed storage network. Um, it requires a lot of behind the scenes optimization, it requires, you know, uh, fair amount of technical expertise and consulting and but many, many partnerships, but we can do it. We did it in 2016. So I think um, I think it really is the way of the future. Um, it just requires us thinking about things differently. And I think really um, you know, pushing the adoption of EVs through policy rather than hindering the adoption. Yeah. I'm happy to jump in there as well. So sort of going back to the theme of history, uh, I mean, you might recall in the lead up to the Green Olympic Games that uh, Holden and CSIRO were working on a, a hybrid electric vehicle. So we could have actually been manufacturing hybrid electric cars in this country. And the offer was made to the federal government, John Howard at the time, uh, that they could purchase it for their fleet vehicles for an additional $5,000 per vehicle. And the government at that stage said no. So. You know, that's that's kind of the story of one, one of the stories of history. You can go and see it in the Powerhouse Museum if you want to do that. Uh, but in, in terms of how we accelerate that now, uh, I mean, certainly we need to be thinking, you know, coming back to the, the role of you know, policy and regulations, infrastructure. Need, you know, I've been speaking to some of my friends and they've been saying, oh, I'd really like to buy a fully EV, but I'm not sure about infrastructure and charging facilities. So we need to give people confidence that there are those infrastructure charging facilities in place, that it isn't going to take a long time. I mean, you know, the ACT government uh, many years ago with Better Place, uh, we're going to roll out EVs very significantly uh, and, you know, use it as a test bed for other parts of Australia, and maybe we could uh, really look to, to do that. It takes about 20 years to change over the whole of Australia's uh, vehicle fleet. So we would need to be thinking about you know, providing incentives or getting you know, the, the fleet vehicle uh, managers to be changing it over for state councils, federal government, uh, you know, and providing some incentives there. That goes straight into the secondary 
uh, market for for sales and then you know, be thinking about how we, we accelerate that. So yeah, I think there is a real big opportunity to, to do that, but it would need to have some very concerted effort to, to make it doable and feasible within the next couple of years. So uh, I comment and say that it is happening. It's absolutely happening. And um, I see um, in EVs um, as hand, hand in glove with the whole debate around distributed energy. Uh, so we're, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about the high level transition here from uh, renewable generation resources at a large scale and interconnection down into our communities to share one uh, clean resource. But there's an equally compelling revolution happening at the distribution end, where we have lots of PV, we have lots of micro wind, we have lo lots of local batteries, and we will have EV. Most EVs will be charged either at home or at the workplace. And that's a challenge for the distribution systems. It's a challenge for that DER space. And I feel strongly that um, it, this is now with us. And there is most of the utilities around Australia are actively planning uh, their distributed systems, their distribution low voltage systems to cope with um, at least one in, in most two car families in the next five years, one of those cars is going to be an EV. And I, I agree with you, Monica, over a 20 year period, we will have seen the uh, petrol engine and diesel engine go the way of the cart and horse. So it will be EV um, and it's going to go hand in glove with that renewable energy resource charging an EV, which is a, a much better way to transport this round, much more exciting to drive as well. But I would say that this is something that's with us right now. And in a planning sense, most utilities around Australia, including TAS Networks, is deeply involved in planning this out. Yeah, and we should be, uh, be in my view, and that one, um, like in Australia, we are a bit running behind. So we have a lot of uh, examples in the world that we can learn lesson from. So which is which can be a good thing uh, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Matt, I'm just going to throw back to you. But just Sam, just very briefly, um, do we have the results of that poll? Um, did um, did the audience agree with um, the panelists? Um, that's interesting. It was a multiple choice, so we get more than 100%, but um, obviously political will, rules and regulations, um, and supply chain constraints and social license, or an incumbency. So um, hmm. interesting to see that technology and access to capital, not really big issues, of, though of course they could be if Australia fails to move, um, or we have some hmm. other issues. Matt, are you driving an EV yet? Not yet, I'm afraid to, to say, but the conversations are active in the household at the moment as to what the next one's going to be. Um, and I think it actually for that question raises an interesting point because the conversations are, well, if we don't get an EV the next time around, what are we going to do when we try and sell the next petrol car that we buy? Is that going to, are we, do we need to make the leap now because, simply because of that? And I think some of um, Simon's and Eric's comments earlier about capture and change and incumbency are, 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 are present in this discussion around EVs because I had discussions many, a few years ago with a, a car manufacturer who told me that in their view the, um, the environmental um, scandal that Volkswagen went through provided one of the biggest incentives for car manufacturers to make that somebody else's problem. And so um, at $41 billion and change for them, it was a cheap decision to shift to um, EVs for a car manufacturer, just simply from that perspective. So I, I, I'm wondering whether we're gonna be in the situation where whether we want to or not, we won't be able to do anything else in a few years. That's the only type of vehicle we'll actually be able to buy. Well, it's interesting. I think from a financial point of view, I think if you can sell your petrol car now and wait three years to buy your electric vehicle, then you'd be fine. But you might have to walk for an extra time in between. <laughs> it's probably the problem. <laughs> Look, um, I'd just like to sort of thank all the, um, the uh, we're just going to sort of, I just want to get sort of final thoughts, if there are any final thoughts from, from everyone, just, uh, just very briefly. Um, and thanks for all, uh, answering the questions, everyone um, in the audience there, and also for all the um, 
um, the thing. So, um, Monica, maybe from you, just just a, just a quick final thought observation. Do you walk away? Well, not not maybe from this webinar, but just sort of from the developments this year with the crisis, the political changes, more or less optimistic. Uh, well, you know, we live in very challenging times. I think that uh, there are a lot of issues that we're going to have to, to deal with. Uh, and I'm very keen to continue the conversation, particularly around that social licence piece. Uh, we are also living, you know, the climate crisis and we need to deal with this. Australia is well positioned to take advantage and become a renewable energy superpower. I know the people I work with in industry are very keen to work um, collaboratively and be part of the solution. I know government agencies we speak to, you know, they're very keen to be driving this. Government procurement is a big lever for change, but we have to bring the community along with us. And that's part of it is that capacity building and skills development as well. So very keen to continue that conversation. Thank you. Terrific. Sean, some final words? Um, look, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I think it's, a, it's great to see how far we've come in two years. I mean, there was some debate still, even two years ago in Australia here, about whether this transition was ever going to occur. I, th I think the Rubicon is definitely being crossed. So we're, we're in the midst of it now. Um, my concern is around the volatility. And, you know, transitions inevitably bring volatility. And I'm worried about knee-jerk reactions in either the regulatory space or the political space that lead to bad policy. So I think if we can keep, keep it calm, and motor on through the transition. Uh, I think the next three to five years in particular is key. Um, so that's my focus to make sure that we damp down the volatility, deliver that security of supply our society needs. And I think if we can accomplish that, we'll, we'll get through a transition pretty seamlessly. Fantastic, Simon. Um, so I'm, I, I'm in uh, violent agreement with Sean and, uh, and Monica. I'm incredibly optimistic uh, compared with um, how things are today. So just um, to let you know, I'm uh, signed up with Amber, so I'm paying real-time prices for my electricity. And, uh, <laughs> and That's why you uh, moved to Fiji. <laughs> Emo's <laughs> forecasting that the price is going to $17.55 per kilowatt hour tonight, so I'm screwed today. It can only get better tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not too sure whether that's an optimistic or a pessimistic outcome there, but um, no, <laughs> I mean, no, I think I know. I think the, I think the transition once we get over it will eliminate that. Uh, the you know the, the real issue of the is the volatility is uh, we but once we get past that will be will be yeah. will be good for clean sailing. Yeah. That's exactly the point that Sean was making, as you say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, I feel very um, happy and privileged that would be. Uh, in this era and as part of this transition and trying to help this transition and I'm very optimistic as well so like as I said all all parties need to really uh, put their best foot put uh, foot forward so they can make this happen as quickly as possible it is something that in my view it is happening uh, so we all need to help to make it happen sooner great um, and Eric yeah look I agree with Amir I, I think this is actually going to happen faster than we think um, but I also think, you know, there's a huge opportunity here. You know, the technology side of thing could be the great uh, job creation scheme for the 21st century. And in fact, it almost certainly will. Um, another key thing is I think, you know, people that are seen as being blockers, you know, some of today's managers, whether they're in utilities or the regulatory space or government policy, they're going to see the futility um, of the current framework and will, you know, certainly uh, vigorously uh, support the change and help speed that change up. Um, you know, we've got a very, very bright future. Uh, we just have to grasp it with both hands. And Matt, you put the question out in the first place, and will we learn from the past experience? Um, what do you reckon? I think history has already repeated itself, but we're now at an opportunity where we can kind of bend the curve a little bit and get there a lot quicker and uh, and hopefully learn that repeating ourselves is not the way to go. We need to uh, just get this done quicker and accepting sooner. Yeah. Look, um, thank you very much, everyone, for taking part in the panel. I just feel like we just scratched the surface, of course. There's so much more detail that we could go into. Um, lots of great questions from the audience, um, some of them very technology-specific. We probably didn't have the right sort of format to do that. 
Um, so I just thank everyone for, for joining us, for PSC, for sponsoring it, um, and for people behind the scenes. Matt, any final thoughts? I mean, you probably had a whole list of things there that you wanted to ask and never got around to doing so. But... Oh, we could, I reckon we could probably just, if it was just the panellists, even we would be still talking about this come, come tea time tonight. So, um, <laughs> no, like you say, we scratched the surface. I'm very happy with the discussion. And uh, like as, as Amir said, I also feel quite privileged to be at this point in history and in my in my profession. It's a fantastic time to be here. Okay. okay. Thanks once again for everyone. Thanks to all the panelists. You've been fantastic. And um, bye for now.